Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for joining us today on our Sabbath live worship. And thank you for joining us on time. And we're really glad that you can all join us today. So uh, before we start our worship, we would have two announcements today. So first up, uh, for the past few weeks, uh, across Singapore, we have been having small gatherings, small churches. And um, for those of you who have yet uh, to sign up for this, uh, as community leaders, not as uh, Bible study leaders, but as community leaders to invite uh, five other guests to your homes or five other friends to your homes, uh, please contact Pastor James for more information and also for, um, for more, uh, to make any uh, arrangements. And also for those of you who have any uh, queries regarding this, um, please contact Pastor James as well. Yeah, next, um, next announcement is the Discipleship Congress 2020. Um, the Discipleship Congress will be held on 15th, 22nd, and 29th of August, and all this will be on Sabbath. And uh, same as our Facebook Live Worship, it will be held in this platform, the Facebook Live. And um, yeah, so please keep these dates free and uh, stay tuned for more updates. So now, uh, as we enter into the time of praise and worship, let us invite the young adults to lead us. time for our offering and tithes. So uh, as you can see on the, on the screen, um, we have the QR code today. So uh, you can just scan the QR code and it will lead you to AdventistGiving.sg. And from there, you can, um, you can uh, give your offerings and tithes. Um, and you can give in three methods, um, through PayNow, um, through direct bank transfer, or through credit card. So let us just take a minute to give back the blessings that we have received
Let us pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you on this Sabbath day as your humble servants. You are a great provider, the giver of all gifts. Thank you for showering your blessings on us, that we may give back a little of what we have received. Lord, we offer these tithes and offerings into your hands with a joyful and willing heart, knowing that these will be used in your service. Let this be used wisely by the leaders of our churches to bring love and comfort to those who receive it. Help us, Lord, to surrender ourselves for your service, as we all are and all we have are yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. church now is the time for the garden of prayer so let us bow our heads and pray together almighty god in heaven blessed be your name thank you for guiding us through this past week and giving us blessings of health love and the opportunity to come back on this sabbath day to praise and worship you thank you for giving us the technology for us to have access to this live stream week after week as we gather online to continue worshiping you so lord i pray that you be in the presence in the church and as well as the homes of the worshippers as we come together to worship you. I pray you continue to be with this congregation as we seek to draw closer to you as we live day by day, being your witnesses in our homes, workplaces and our own private moments. But Lord, we know we stumble and give in to temptations. Give us the wisdom to not make such mistakes again and forgive our sins as we draw to be better servants. Lord, we seek guidance as we live our lives as we have many different problems and you know our personal struggles lord 
So I pray that you answer the prayers of the congregation at home and be with them in their times of struggle. Today, we would like to pray for Tez and Vernon Lim. Lord, stay close to them as they walk with you. Be there in every moment of their lives. Guide them and protect them, and may they continue to serve you. We would also like to pray for the many obstacles our global and local communities are going through, be it the ongoing pandemic or outbreaks, natural disasters or political instabilities. Continue to shower your people with your blessings as these problems are being handled. Lastly, we would like to pray for James Thumb as he will be preaching to us later. Bless his words and they may, may they reach us. Help us to understand what your message is and may we apply these lessons to our daily lives. Thank you for listening to our prayers and answering our requests, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The scripture reading for today is found in Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Good morning, ASDEC, and welcome back to church. And this morning, I'd like to welcome ASDEC members who are not in Singapore. I know that many of you who are joining us from different countries, from Philippines, from the United States, from Australia, from Canada, from South Africa, from Malaysia, welcome. You are now, by now, a part of ASDEC. We've said it, that if you join ASDEC for two weeks in a row, you are part of the family. You know, the devil has been trying to attack the church. You know, he's tried de various different strategies, but the Bible tells us there's nothing new under the sun. In fact, this persecution from this invisible enemy right now comes in the form of the COVID-19 pandemic. And guess what? Every time there's a persecution, is to wake the church up from complacency. And from that, continuously, God has used this pandemic, these persecutions, to grow the church. And I believe that it's going to happen again in Singapore. We're going to grow again in Singapore. I to go and share with you what we're trying to do in ASDAQ is that we're trying to establish community groups around Singapore. We're no longer going to meet in this location, or at least for quite a while. That is not a problem. That is an opportunity for the church. God is challenging us to not just stay in Jerusalem, but is asking us to spread out, to go to the regions around to be His witness. So Esdek is going to be His representative around Singapore. We don't want just to be at 798 Thompson Road. We want to be at the, in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west, in the northeast. I've added a new location. And we want to be everywhere. And how that's going to happen is not going to be dependent on the church and its programming because that's, that's not possible at the moment. It's going to be on every one of you who belong to ASDAQ. And I can't wait to hear that if there's going to be an ASDAQ in Australia, an ASDAQ in Canada, ASDAQ in uh, North America, as there in, uh, in Malaysia, sure, go ahead and start your community groups there and tune into our service and be a part of this God's work that is trying to change how churches are done. We need community leaders. These community leaders are not Bible study teachers. You know, that's not the expectation. We don't want people who are like leading a group who's like care group, who's going to minister to them spiritually. That's not the, the burden we want to cast on you. We have people who are trained for that. But right now, we need people with one thing, a heart for the community. We need people who may not think that you know a lot. I, I think all of you do, but you may not think you know a lot, may not feel that you're equipped, and some of you may not feel that you're worthy. And I tell you that you are worthy because you are called by God. And all you need to do is have the heart, have, have the love, have the passion for the people who's living around you to start this thing. So right now, the rules in Singapore allows us to have five other people in the house. So if you are one of these people, you want to invite people to join you, do it. Invite them to join you with, of course, a lot of all the safety measures in place. That's why if you are interested, I want to have a chat. I'm not trying to control how you do things, but I just want to 
help you set up some of these safety measures for some of these visitors to your house. Because ASDEC is not about numbers. It's not about how big we want to be. It's about protecting and blessing our community. I don't want people to, to endanger themselves. But at the same time, we don't want people to lose this community experience, which is just as essential for them as physical health. The spiritual health of our community is just as essential as staying safe. So I want you to stay safe physically, healthy. I want you to stay safe spiritually by being a part of a community that the Bible has designed for us to function in that will be blessed by being with one another in this, in this community. So if you want to be, or if you feel called by God to be a community leader, talk to me. We'll have a chat. We'll set it up. Next, I want to remind all of you that in August, after National Day, the three Sabbaths from then, we will be having our virtual discipleship congress. Last year, we gathered together in Thompson Chinese Church, thousand over of us. It was an amazing experience. But this year, due to the pandemic, we are not able to do so. But we want to continue to remind all of us what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and that is to be a disciple of Christ. And being a disciple of Christ, what does that mean? This year, we're going to continue to share with you. Last year, we talked about that it starts with me. It starts with all of us. And this year, we're going to talk about the fact that it, we are all made for more. We're all made for more. Right now, I'll refresh your memory by showing you a video from last year, a highlight video from what happened last year. For saving the lost Go make disciples of all nations Go share the good news of salvation The Discipleship Congress has been really great. I think it's, it's, it's a good gathering of, of all the members across the churches. But just as importantly also is the, the conference to cast this vision. It starts with ourselves, starts with myself, starts with me. I think the Discipleship Congress event is actually quite beneficial in the sense that Adventists are able to learn more and we will need to win more souls for Christ. I learned that definitely I have to do my part. I cannot always rely on pastors and the youth leaders to uh, mix around with seekers. The fulfilling of His call It starts with me To reach one for His cause For this gospel of His kingdom Shall be preached in all the world Then He will come It starts with me have found so insightful is the many experiences that our speakers have come to share with us. I think for me, it's especially given me an extra boost in understanding uh, my responsibility first. As the Congress says, it starts with me. It starts 
So I hope the video has brought back memories about what happened last year. And so what's going to happen this year is it's going to be all virtual. It's going to be all online. But don't, you don't have to worry because it's going to be streamed through this very same link. So if you've been joining SDAC for our live worship for the past how many months? It's going to be from here. So you can come and just tune in at 11 o'clock. That's where the Virtual Discipleship Congress is going to be streamed at. But one thing extra that's going to happen is in the afternoon it's going to be a Zoom workshop that's uh, conducted by various pastors, specifically on discipleship. So we'll be asking you to sign up for all these uh, different workshops, and we'll send you the link, and from the comfort of your home, you can join in for these discipleship workshops in the afternoon. So for three consecutive Sabbaths from 15, 22nd, and 29, it will be the Discipleship Congress 2020. It will be very memorable, because it's the first time we have to do this virtually, and it will go down in history that it was the discipleship congresses held in a pandemic. And I can't wait to see how God will launch the ministry in Singapore from this pandemic. And this congress is just going to be another push towards fulfilling our commission right here. We are on the series of the Beatitudes. We are on the series of what it means to live in the kingdom of God. And the scripture, the beatitude we are coming to for this today's sermon is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You ask me, Pastor James, why are we talking about the Sermon on the Mount at this juncture? And I'll tell you, it is because there are people that need us. What do I mean by that? As the scripture reading today tells us that we are called to be the bearer of good news, the bringer of peace. Right now, there's a lot of people who have lost their peace from various reasons. And God knew that it's going to happen. God knew that as the end draws near, that things are going to go crazy. And He's prepared a group of people And that's you and me as his community who has been called to bring this message of the gospel, this message of peace to those people out there who at this moment have lost hope, have lost peace, has lost a sense of normalcy, which I think is a good thing. Because normal has not worked for us. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus, 2,000 over years ago, has already established what his kingdom is going to look like. And we have to learn about what it means to be a truly loving community, not to the strangers, but to those around us, whose God has placed in our immediate influence. How do we love our brothers and sisters more? How do we love and live like a kingdom citizen to our family, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our colleagues, to our classmates, to all those people that we interact with? God is calling for His community to bring this gospel to them. Blessed are the pure in heart. You know, many people, whenever they hear this word pure, me too, I think of not being tainted. You know, I I think of how I have to keep myself from certain things. And if you are in a Christian circle, it's uh, purity in terms of your practices. Are you adhering to what the Scripture says? Are you maintaining sexual purity? All these things come to mind whenever we hear this word. And we bring that along with us when we read this Scripture, that blessed are the pure, and, and we think, oh, that's what God is expecting me to do. And you know what's the reaction that all of us make, uh, or the conclusion that we make in the end? I can't do it. I can't be pure. And so God is giving me an expectation that I can't meet. And the reaction is, we give up. Well, God must not really mean what He says here. 
But it's not God doesn't mean what He says, but I think we've misunderstood. But let us look at the word pure. You know, recently during this COVID-19 um, pandemic, especially during the circuit breaker, uh, a lot of people have become bakers. And I've told you that my wife has joined the ranks, joined the ranks. And in fact, this is the exact thing that we just bought recently, is to sift the flour. It's a strange, right? For those who don't bake, I was like, yeah, I don't really bake, but I've heard about it. Is you, you, you buy a pack of flour from, from, the, from, the, from the supermarket, right? And you bring it home, you look at it, it's like, it's like most of the time, most of the time it's like pure white, right? It's like, it's pure, it, it's gone through the factory, they've done their duties, the machine have, of course, clearly, of course, if it's not clean and pure, then definitely like the, the government's going to catch them, right? It's going to be illegal. And we're going we're gonna, to like get diarrhea if we eat it. So it can't be. It's, it's packed. It's sealed. It must be pure. But then you go and you look online and you look at people who, who, who make stuff and they go through this, this process. They pour this pure flour over this sifting thing. So it used to be you have to take a sieve and you're going like, to knock it. You're going like, to knock it, knock it, knock it, knock it, and then you, it will go down. But this thing, this new gadget, I'm not promoting this gadget. I don't get paid. But it's, like, it's really helpful, right? You don't even have to shake it. You just, you just grab it and the thing will go inside automatically. Uh, we have not used it yet. We just got it. Uh, and I think it's interesting that this process of sifting, of breaking down the lumps, of, of extracting any leftover impurities is what the word in the scripture actually is very closely related to. The purity that the scripture talks about is being sifted. It's being, like the purity being taken out. And one of the key ideas of this is that purity is maintained or achieved not by the flower themselves shaking themselves and making themselves pure, but it's done by an external force. It is something that is done to the flower that makes it pure. So the idea in the scripture, it says, blessed are the pure, is that you must experience something that is done to you externally. Not something that you do by wanting, by behaving better, or by knowing more. A lot of people talk about purity, they talk about, oh, I need to know what the Bible says more, and if I know more, I will be pure. No such thing. In this idea of purity in the Beatitudes, it's talking about an external force coming in, to sift you, shake you up, put you in a circumstance that as after you come up from that, you are pure. So it's something that somebody else has to do for us. You can't do it by yourself. And in fact, the scripture talks about where this purity comes from. See, the, the Pharisee misunderstood this verse uh, and uh, a lot of the, this is actually not a new thing for the Israelites. It's something that the scripture in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, in the Exodus uh, uh, time period talks about. That's why they, they, they know about it. The, the term is not unfamiliar, but they've misunderstood what it actually entails. And so for the, for the, for the Pharisees, it means like, I must be clean. And remember the story of the Good Samaritan where an Israelite, a Jew, was on the roadside. He's been robbed and he's, he's lying there and the, free, the priest and the Levite walks by and says, I can't touch him because he will make me impure. That the idea of purity is so warped by the people back there that they have refused to help somebody who is dying in order to maintain purity. Some of us may have fallen into this trap of keeping ourselves pure in our doctrines, pure in our understanding of God, pure in our relationship. We've excluded everybody else from our lives. So that we'll be not be tainted. It's just like, you know, in the circuit breaker, the safest thing to do, and that's a good thing, it's not a bad thing, the safest thing to do is not go, don't go out. Right? That's why we had a circuit breaker, right? Stay at home. Even right now in phase two, it is still better to stay at home. Because if you go out, you have the, the, the chance of rubbing shoulders and meeting somebody who may carry the virus and the virus may pass to you. And that's how the Pharisee and, and the people, uh, people of the law understood this purity. But Jesus came and says, sorry, you've misunderstood it. The way to clean this thing is not to just abstain and keep yourself safe, but that the fact he's just commenting on the fact that you are actually already impure that you have to be cleansed not from the outside in, but from the inside out. That's what's inside of you that needs to be sifted by an external power. 
that's what will make you pure. That's why he says, blessed are the pure in heart. See, we can act as Christians. We can act in ways that may, may look to the world as good. We may be the nicest person in church. Note my focus of in church. You may be the kindest person in church. But are you? Even if you are able to be consistent with your family, with your church friends, and with your workplace and your school, but deep in your heart, you know who you are. And the, the news is God knows who we are. And God says, no, I, I, I don't want us to clean you up externally. I want to clean you up from the inside out. Imagine if Lucas, he goes out and he plays in the mud. That is like... Tiffany will freak out, right? That's not allowed. <laughs> like, he, he's not allowed to walk on the grass. <laughs> like, like, you know, uh, this is like confession time. Tiffany doesn't know. But sometimes when I bring him out by myself, we're not as clean as she wants us to be. Now we'll walk in the grass. We'll climb on the playground. You know, like the hands dirty, everything. She'll be like freaking out. I'll be like, but, but the thing is, right? If, imagine if Lucas goes out and it rains and it's muddy and he's, he's old enough to play football, right? And he goes and runs in the field and he's playing football and it's all muddy and all dirty. And he actually, while playing and sliding in the football field, he swallows some mud, and that's causing him to be sick, and he comes home, right? And all we do is we give him a shower. All right, Lucas, you're dirty, your shoe's dirty, you got mud on your face, let's go to the bathroom, I'll clean you up, but I don't deal with the, the soil that he swallowed, and it's causing his tummy to, to act up, and it's giving him a bad tummy. That, which one is worse? Dirty outside or dirty inside? Of course, it's best to be clean outside and inside. But you know what we've been doing as Christians? We've been focusing on being clean on the outside, whereas we've swallowed the mud, and the mud is still in our tummy, the germs, the bacteria, everything is still causing us to have a diarrhea, and we're still, we still have not fixed that yet. And we think, oh, okay. But we know we're not. God says, I want you to be pure in your heart, and I want to clean you from the inside out. And why, why does he want us to do that? Because blessed are the pure in heart, for, therefore, and because of that, they shall see God. And you'd be like, God is really mean. God has this like high expectation. It's like, if I don't clean myself up, I'm not worthy to see God. It's like, you know, meeting the Queen of England, you know, you better dress up well. You better, like, put on nice shoes. You better, like, comb your hair and then go see her. And we imagine God to be like that, you know, to be this person who's so pure that any virus that we bring along will kill him. He's God. He's not, he's not somebody who's, like, human and dies from virus. In fact, he can tell the virus to go and kill itself and the virus will, will, will commit suicide. But God is, when he says, when we see God, it's not that he expects us to be good enough for him. He's saying, dude, I'm going to make you good enough so you can see me. And the word see here actually represents experience. Experience him. How many of you have gone through your Christian walk with Jesus for years and years and years, and you still say to yourself, man, I don't know God very well. I've not had that experience of who God is. I've not had that life-changing moment. Of course, not everyone will have that life-changing moment. But you feel like you, you're the same. You've been in church for 20, 30, 40 years, and you're still the same. You've not had that closeness. In fact, you're still at times saying, God, you, know, you there? And that's not because we're not good enough. It's because we're not allowing Him. He has to make us pure so that after being purified from the inside out, we can be good enough to see Him. Not because that we will have to act in a certain way, but then we can see clearly. It's like, you know, Joanne will know this, you know, like if my glasses have not been clean for 10 years, and I, you know, nowadays the technology is better, like the glasses is anti-fingerprint, anti-smudge, and then mud, but it's still gross, right? Especially in Singapore. Singapore is like the killer of good things. Remember, let's talk about that. Um, uh, things will grow on it, right? And I, if I don't ever wash it, don't ever clean it, no matter how good the technology is, like my, my lenses are off, fogged up with oil stains and everything, and I just keep wearing it. And then my friend who I, like, comes to me and says, James, do you know how I look like? And I'm like, oh, of course I know, but my glasses are like, like that. I can't really see my friend clearly. I can't experience him in the proper way. You know, if I go out and eat prata with him, man, my hand all prata oil, and then I go smudge my glasses. And so my friend is all, like, smudgy. And then my friend offers and says, hey, man, James, 
Guess what? I have soap. Can I clean your glasses for you so that you can see me clearly as who I am? And I go, nah, nah, it's, it's fine, man. It's okay. And then we say, you know, bro, I've known you for 10 years. I don't really know how your face looks like, man. And your friend's like, dude, clean your glasses. And I want to clean your glasses for you. That's us and God. When he says being pure, he's saying that let me clean you up, remove the obstacles, remove the smudges, the oil, the stains, the dirt, the algae that's growing on your glasses so that you can see me, so that you can know who I am, so that you can experience me. But he will not force us. He will not grab the glasses off our face and just clean it up. He says, would you be willing to give me your glasses so I can put in this hypersonic soap something that you can clean your glasses. I love that. Whenever I go to the optician, I get my eyes checked and they take my glasses, right, to measure the, 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 the degree and then they do that cleaning for me. Oh, so clean. It's like going to the dentist. No matter how you brush your teeth, it's not going to be the same as going to the dentist. That feeling afterwards when you run your tongue over your teeth, it's like, oh, you mean my, my teeth have been so, can be so clean? Because they have the tools. doesn't matter if you have an electric toothbrush. Because you can't see everything. And you don't spend enough time brushing your teeth. Man, I'm being like health education. But it's just like you, you need somebody else to help you because there are areas of blindness that you can't see. And God saying, I want to help you with that. Would you let me? Would you let me so that you can experience me? You know, if, you, if you're sick and tired of being in church and not experiencing God, I would say that's where we need to go. That's where we need to go. But, this, you know, Jesus wasn't talking to, to us living in the 20th century, 21st century, uh, when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount. He's not preaching to Singaporeans in year 2020 going through a pandemic. He had an audience. And of course, among these audience were his disciples, his newly recruited disciples, and of course, the crowd who he was healing. The Bible tells us that he was healing the sick, uh, opening the eyes of the blind, uh, helping the lame walk. And so these people were following him. Of course, Ben, if somebody just healed you, you will follow him. But among these people, remember, this is not the part of Jesus where people hate him. People don't hate Jesus yet. People just like, they're listening to this really charismatic preacher who is really an awesome guy who is performing miracles. He's at that stage. So everybody's not really sure who Jesus is at this moment. But there are four distinct group of people who are specifically uh, present who are listening to Jesus. So we are not them, but there are principles we can learn from their experience that we need to apply today. That's why it's called the Bible, right? It's there because there are eternal principles that's applicable for eternity. But we have to understand first their context of what they go through. So first group that we're very familiar with in the church, we always bring them out and we, we, just, like, we just point at them and say, don't be like them. And poor guys, man. But do you know like one of the early founding members of the church, of our modern church, of the early ex church that we give so much praise about was from this group of people? A lot of them. A lot of them were Pharisees. So the first group is the other Pharisees that's listening to Jesus. Right, so the Pharisees, who are they? We, we know. We know the word. They are legalists. They adhere to the rules. But as I was researching more about them, there were actually more that I realized about them that I knew about them before. They were actually legalists, but they were also very contextual. They'll apply the spirit of the law. They would look at the law and go, all right, what is, what is it trying to say? How can I apply it? But then they went a bit crazy. They took the principle and applied it to more than what the principle was supposed to do. All right? And one of the problems with these guys is that they keep looking back at their tradition and they try to protect what God has given to them. Is that a bad thing? No. But then when they look back into their history, these Pharisees, they did not look back far enough. They got stuck at the Maccabees period. They got stuck at the kingdoms, the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdoms, where God was punishing the Israelites for being unfaithful to His law. And they look at that and they were so scared, they took the law and said, how can we apply not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, and they expanded it into this monster that was unrealistic. But if only they look back far enough. And so, but these people were also people who were very flexible. 
but not in an entirely pleasant way. They're flexible in the application where because they'll apply certain things to a certain group of people, but then they'll excuse it if circumstance shown otherwise. But then people, human beings, right, they misuse this flexibility to justify them not being faithful to the Word of God in the true spirit of the Scripture. For example, one of the things that they'll do is they'll, they'll look at the law and they'll go, all right, that's, that's something that I should do. I should donate money to the church. But then the law also says I should take care of my parents. But the law says that donating to the church and supporting God's Word is more important. And so they donate to the church and they'll not support their parents. That is wrong. Because in Ten Commandments, it says, honor thy father and thy mother. And it says, man, I'm honoring my father and my mother in the utmost sense by sacrificing their needs for the church. Flexible. Rubbish. Then there's the next group who are listening to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. These were the Sadducees. These were the rich people. The richer people who were also politicians. They were in power, and in a way, they were the ruling class. So the Jews were not uh, in charge of their own country anymore. The, the Romans came, but they still needed local people to, to be in charge of the local people. So they selected this group, which were the, the heirs or the descendants of the priests, the high priests of the temple. And they called them the Sadducees. And they were the ruling class, and they were the one who was in charge. And, um, but these people will, will be similar to what we call the liberals today. For them, they're like, yeah, I'll follow the rules of God, if it benefits me. And they're, 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 but they were re- interesting. It's, it's not terribly interesting in my research. They're liberals in, in application, but they're very conservative in what they kept. They only followed the first five books of the Old Testament. They rejected everything after that. So they're like, well, you know, in, in, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, there was no mention of resurrection, so there must not be any resurrection a bit liberal, but a bit crazy. And they go like, oh, the first five doesn't talk about angels, so no, no angels exist. Although in Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the prophets after that, there's mention of experience with angels in the book of Daniel, angel Gabriel comes, and, and, and even in Abraham's story, there's angels, but they, they didn't accept that. I don't know why. So they're liberals in what they adapted, but they kept themselves to the first five of the Bibles. And these are people who I say, but the most important thing for them was how I would advance my life on earth. Because why? Because they did not believe that there's going to be a second coming of Jesus. They did not believe in the future heaven. They think that life on earth is all that we have. So they look forward in how I can have a better life and I'll apply the scripture, whatever benefits me, and use it. But they didn't look far enough to the fact that Jesus is coming back and then life on earth will end. So these are conservative in the sense that they kept first five books, but they are conservative only for life on earth. See, you can see how the different groups are not how we stereotype them to be. They are a little bit of both, which is very Jewish, you know. You ask them, is the answer yes or no? They're like, yeah, you're right. You're right. So everyone has a little, and the honest truth is I think all of us are a little bit like that. I don't like stereotyping people, labeling people, conservative, liberals, traditionalists, progressive. We all have a little bit of everything. We have some things that we're more conservative about and something we're more open-minded about. All of us are growing and, you know, if you look at people, we always find the faults of others. And if you look at ourselves, we'll look at how good we are. So let's not do that. Let's not do that. Then there's a third group, the third recognized official group. There's a fourth group, which I'm going to talk about. There's a third group called the Essenes. The Essenes were people who, were, we have to thank them for one very important thing. They were the people or the keeper or the writer, author, uh, scriber, I would say, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The fact we have our entire Bible with us today and we have confidence it is the accurate Word of God is because of the Essenes. They hid in mountains and they copied the Bible by hand onto parchments and they kept it in jars and uh, which then show us that the scripture we read in our, uh, on, on, we have in our hands today is 99% exactly the same as what they read back 2,000, 4,000 years ago. Confidence is exactly the same. Exactly the same. 99%. That's crazy. Right? So these people, well, who are they? Who are they? These are the pre- preservation, preservationists. Preservationists. They want to keep stuff. 
cheap stuff. They want to protect stuff. That's why we have the Bible. But one of the side effects of them is they also are only concerned about protecting themselves. So what they do, they don't mingle with people and then they run away into the mountains and hide themselves. They hide themselves there and if a new person wants to join them, you have to be under quarantine for two years before you can be a part of the community. And one of the worst things that for me about being a part of this community, you're not really allowed to talk. When you go to a scene gathering, you don't talk. You just hang out and look at each other and nod. And that's all you do because they don't want to waste energy. And, and they just like depart from people to keep ourselves safe because we don't want to be corrupted by their practices. So I will run away. This is not good. I was listening. And they thought Jesus was one of them because Jesus' predecessor or the person who was opening his path, John the Baptist, felt like one of them. You know, he lived in the wilderness. He ate locusts and honey. He wear camel hair. He is weird. And the Essenes are weird. And they're like, he weird. He says somebody's coming and he points to Jesus. Jesus, I think Jesus may be an Essene too. And so they were there. They came out of the caves and they were listening to Jesus. All right? So these people were people who look inward. They look at, they just focus on themselves and what I need to do to keep myself pure, to keep myself uncorrupted, to keep myself in line with God. But one of the problems is they look inward, but they don't look deep enough. They thought that by excluding their physical presence from others, they will be kept aligned with God's requirements. But if they look deep in, enough in their hearts, they'll know that they're not, they'll never be good enough by their own efforts. So we call them the ascetics. So they run away and they hide in the mountains and they leave the mountain and they love that. Some of us are like that. Some of us don't like to mingle with people. Some of us are enjoying the circuit breaker a little bit too much. You know, we don't have to come to church. Yes. No potluck. <laughs> I don't know, man. We need to talk. <laughs> right? like, like some of you enjoy this and it's, it's normal. All of us are different. All of us are different. That's cool. That's cool. But then there's that fourth group of people who are like, man, these guys... They're not officially recognized as a group, but they exist. And in fact, one of Jesus' disciples had this name, Simon the Zealot. Zealot is not his father's name. Zealot was who he is in his practice. The Zealots are activists. They, they believe in the cause, they'll go out and they'll do something about it. And they get really upset when uh, the group that they belong to, the community that they belong to, are not moving, are not doing things. And they're like, let's go, man. Let's go, Pastor James. Let's go, let's go do something about this issue. They're really excited people. And they go out and they look at what's out there and then what's needed to be done. But one of the problems with the zealous is they look outward on the needs of people, but they're not kind enough. If they see somebody who's poor and hungry on the street, they'd be like, oh man, there's so much injustice in that. Let me go protest. And they walk away from that poor, hungry person and not give him a bread. You know? Miss the point a little bit. But I say, no, 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 no. My calling is to activate the change. I can't waste time meeting the need of this one person. i got to change a society, man. Unfortunately, who they are closest related to in a modern era, they're the terrorists, man. They're the terrorists. So there's this four group of people and the other common folks who have inclination towards one of these four groups, sitting among the crowd who are listening to Jesus. But Jesus says, I'm calling you to be none of any of these four. As he describes, as he preached the Sermon on the Mount, as he talks about his Beatitudes, he's showing people that my followers will have the good aspects of all these four, but they will have none of the bad of these four. But I love how Jesus acts because Jesus doesn't just preach the sermon. He leaves the act. He leaves it out himself. And the fact is, later on, after we go through this theoretical section of the Sermon on the Mount, you see how Jesus exemplify them. Exemplify them. In fact, you, you, as I said, mentioned earlier, he didn't ostracize the zealot. He took one of them as his disciple, his personal disciple who walked with him for 12 years. Or 12 years. For three and a half years the 12 disciples who walk with him for three and a half years. He accepts them. He doesn't just criticize and judge and says, you're not good enough for my kingdom. He says, welcome. Join my kingdom. 
follow me and I'll show you what it really means to be a part of my kingdom. And that is why there were a lot of Pharisees that later converted and followed the way. That's what Christianity was called back in uh, the early days. Because Jesus continually talked to them and, and struggled with them, you know. Every comment, every criticism he had of the Pharisee was him trying to reach them. And some did. Some hearts were melted. In fact, we hear the famous one, Nicodemus. He was both a Sadducee and a Pharisee. Crazy, dude. Ruling class, Pharisee in his practice, and then eventually he became a follower of Jesus. So much so that without Nicodemus, probably nobody would have taken down the body of Jesus because guess what? The 12 disciples all left him. It was this one Pharisee that came and took Jesus. So he's calling for Christians to, re- to examine ourselves as we read through the Sermon of the Mount, as we look at the Beatitudes, to look at our lives and see what inclination I have. Am I a Pharisee? Am I a Sadducee? Am I a Essene? Or am, am I a Zealot? And what are the good things that, that, that's from this tendency? And, and keep, that, keep that. And the bad thing says, God, I want to be pure. I, want, I don't want to be proud and brag about who I am as a Pharisee, Sadducee, Essene, or Zealot. I want you, I need you to come and change me to become who you intend for me to be so that I can be the one that go out into the needy, the hopeless, the troubled, and bring them this gospel of peace, goodness, and kindness. So God is asking his followers to be like the Pharisees, to look back at the traditions. Traditions are not bad, but look far enough to look at God's original design and plan that was found in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. God is asking us to look forward, but to look further. To look beyond this earthly life and to look beyond that and to look to Jesus' second coming. To live life on earth, realizing, remembering that life on earth is not the end. Jesus is coming again. And also to look inward into our hearts like the Essenes. To look into the true condition of our hearts. To realize how helpless like babies that we are at purifying ourselves and asking the Holy Spirit to come forth and clean us from the inside out. And Jesus is calling all of us, his followers, to look outward. Look at the needs of those around you. Of course, you need to fight for their needs when the time comes, when it's necessary. But at the same time, you need to look at them with kindness and love to stop from your journey, to stop where you're going. Like the Samaritan, although you are rushing to somewhere for something important, you will take the time to stop and look at this man who's, who's injured, helpless, and need you. And you just stop and share a little bit of that love and kindness that God has shown you. So, church, as that, I don't want to just look at you and, and, and just mention you as a, a generic community. All of us need to know each other personally. And the, the truth is, all of us know somebody else personally that needs to hear this message of love, hope, and joy. God is asking you to be that person. But first, let us plead with God to come and purify us from the inside out. Every act starts with me.
so shine forth with love from a Father above. With all my heart will I do my part. It starts with me, the fulfilling of His call. It starts with me to reach one for His cause. For this gospel of His kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then He will come. It starts with me. We are the light of the world. With a mission for saving the lost Making disciples of all nations Showing to all that Jesus is Lord It starts with me, the fulfilling of His call It starts with me to reach one for His cause. For this gospel of His kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then He will come. It starts with me. I am a disciple, discipling for Jesus. We are His disciples, this time before our Lord. It starts with me, the fulfilling of His call. It starts with me, to reach one for His cause. For this gospel of His kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then He will come. I pray that your spirit will work in all of us, that you will cleanse us from those things that distract us, that blinds us, that blocks us from experiencing you. And may we, with the Spirit's help, re-examine ourselves, that we'll become followers of Jesus and not just of any of the four mentioned kind of people. We want to be like Jesus because Jesus has lived out that life for us as an example. Guide us, Lord, on this Sabbath day. Lead us to be your light. It starts with me. Help us to do so. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. And I ask that you join us again next Sabbath, same time.